Welcome back to Signal Ditch, where today we're finally talking about high vacuum. We'll start out with some background information about vacuum in general, and talk about the different levels of vacuum that we can achieve in the lab. This way you have some context for what I mean when I say high vacuum. Then we'll talk about some of the equipment that's necessary to achieve and maintain high vacuum. And finally, I'll walk you through the high vacuum system that I designed for my experiments, including how I sourced and hacked some of the critical odds and ends. Earlier in the series, we talked about why thermionic valves need to be under a vacuum to operate correctly. It all boils down to getting those gas molecules out of the way so that electrons can travel in a straight line between the active elements. But just how rarefied does the atmosphere inside a vacuum tube need to be? Vacuum is quantified in units of pressure, a vacuum being any space with a pressure considerably below atmospheric. When we say that something contains a very high vacuum, we really mean that it contains a very low pressure. And because historically there have been several different units of measurement for pressure, you're likely to see vacuum expressed in several different units. The SI unit of pressure is the Pascal, with one standard atmosphere equaling 101,325 Pascals. A lot of commercial vacuum equipment won't actually give you a vacuum readout in Pascal, at least not directly, which brings us to the next unit of measurement, the bar. Bar is the non-SI metric measurement for pressure, where one atmosphere equals 1.013 bar. If that number looks familiar, it's because the bar is an SI-defined unit. With one standard atmosphere being equal to 1,300 pascals, or hectopascals, as well as 1.013 bar, it's easy to see that the millibar, or thousandth of a bar, is equivalent to a hectopascal. The millibar is a far more common unit of measurement on both vacuum gauges and vacuum equipment datasheets. The other most common unit of measurement for vacuum is the tor. The tor is defined as being 1 760th of a standard atmosphere. Although this is a modern redefinition, it was originally intended to represent 1 mm of mercury, or the extra pressure generated by a column of mercury 1 mm high. In fact, the millimeter mercury has itself been redefined, and so the two units have drifted apart from their original equivalents. That said, the relative difference between these two units is so small that in most cases they're still considered equivalent. Most of the time, vacuum is defined in absolute pressure, although sometimes you will see mention of relative pressure, especially relative to an atmosphere, as in a few millimeters of mercury below atmosphere. Partial vacuums, or in other words, the imperfect vacuums that we create in a laboratory, can be divided up into five categories based on their absolute pressure, starting with rough vacuum at one end, all the way up to extreme high vacuum on the other. Rough vacuum, also called low vacuum, covers the range from atmospheric pressure down to 100 pascals. At this pressure, gases still act like a fluid and exhibit viscous flow. Gases start to transition out of viscous flow in medium or so-called fine vacuum, which covers the range from 100 pascal down to a tenth of a pascal. From high vacuum and below, gases begin to exhibit molecular flow. High vacuum covers the range from a tenth of a pascal down to 1 times 10 to the negative 6 pascal. From 10 to the negative 6 down to 10 to the negative 9, we call this range ultra-high vacuum, and anything below 10 to the negative 9 we call extreme high vacuum. According to Wikipedia, the lowest pressure currently achievable in the laboratory is in the neighborhood of 10 to the minus 11 pascal. So revisiting our earlier question, the atmosphere inside a vacuum tube is usually between 10 to the minus 6 and 10 to the minus 9 tor, depending on the type of device. This lands us somewhere straddling the line between high vacuum and ultra high vacuum. That said, the vacuum system itself doesn't necessarily need to achieve ultra high vacuum. If I can get the tube down to high vacuum using the vacuum system, I can seal it and then use a chemical getter inside of the vacuum tube to bring the pressure down to ultra-high vacuum. For context, we're talking about a pressure that's about halfway between the atmospheric pressure on Earth and on the Moon. In order to create this high vacuum environment, you basically need two things. A vacuum chamber, which in my case is the glass envelope of the tube itself, and a pump to remove as many molecules of gas from that chamber as possible. Vacuum pumps basically break down into two categories, high vacuum pumps and roughing pumps. 
Roughing pumps are mechanical pumps that are capable of achieving a rough vacuum. Their action depends on gases acting like a fluid, and their design is often not all that different from water pumps or air compressors. Most roughing pumps that you'll encounter, from cheap refrigeration service pumps all the way up to expensive lab equipment, will be oil-sealed rotary vane pumps. However, in applications that are very sensitive to oil contamination, or where you're pumping a process gas that might react with your pump oil, you might find pumps that use no oil at all, such as diaphragm or scroll pumps. However, pumps of this style for vacuum applications can be incredibly expensive. But why are we talking about roughing pumps anyway? We don't want rough vacuum, we want high vacuum. Well, because roughing pumps operate in a regime where gas molecules still act like a fluid, they can displace a lot of volume very quickly, which means they're still the best tool for getting from atmospheric pressure down to rough vacuum. In addition, high vacuum pumps won't even operate at atmospheric pressure. You need to have a roughing pump to generate a low enough four-line pressure for the high vacuum pump to even start working. There are basically three types of high vacuum pumps that are currently in use. One common style of high vacuum pump is the oil diffusion pump. The oil diffusion pump is popular because it contains no moving parts. It achieves vacuum by using high-speed jets of oil vapor to push gas molecules from the high vacuum side of the pump to the rough vacuum side. These vapor jets are achieved simply by boiling the oil and then forcing it out of a small orifice near the top of the pump. A water-cooled baffle is usually positioned above the diffusion pump to ensure that no oil vapor can make it into the vacuum chamber. The downside of oil diffusion pumps is that they're full of boiling oil, which means that a catastrophic loss in vacuum could result not only in oil contamination to the vacuum chamber, but even possibly in a fire. Another popular type of high vacuum pump is the turbomolecular pump. Much like the oil diffusion pump, the turbomolecular pump relies on momentum transfer to push the gas molecules through the body of the pump. But instead of relying on vapor jets to achieve this momentum transfer, the turbomolecular pump takes a more brute force approach. The turbomolecular pump is an axial compressor, much like the compression stage of a jet engine. It uses rapidly spinning rotor blades to knock the gas molecules from the top of the pump down to the bottom of the pump. These rotor blades have to spin incredibly fast to achieve any pumping action, usually between 50 and 80,000 RPM. As you can imagine, this limits the materials that the rotor blades can be made from, and puts a pretty heavy strain on whatever bearing system is used to mount the axle. Turbo pumps usually have external electronic controllers that both control the motor on the turbo pump and monitor it for drag to make sure it doesn't burn itself out. Because pure turbomolecular pumps don't sustain a very large pressure gradient, they'll often be combined with a molecular drag pump. The drag pump is an older type of high vacuum pump that operates really well in the gradient between the bottom of the turbo stage and rough vacuum. Modern turbomolecular pumps with a drag stage can support high vacuum, with as many as several tor of pressure on the four line, although running a pump in that configuration will require quite a bit of cooling. Another common type of high vacuum pump is the ion pump. Like oil diffusion pumps, ion pumps have no moving parts. However, unlike the other two types of pumps we've talked about, they don't operate on the principle of momentum transfer. Ion pumps work by sputtering a reactive material onto the inside of the pump chamber. This getter material reacts with gases in the vacuum chamber to turn them into solids and sequester them away from the atmosphere. Ion pumps can achieve extremely high vacuum, but because they work on the principle of a chemical getter, their performance will depend on the types of gas that they're pumping. A related pump, the titanium sublimation pump, works on the same principle, but instead of being sputtered, the getter material is thermally evaporated. Already, you can tell that a vacuum system may comprise one or more vacuum chambers, as well as several vacuum pumps, and all of those things need to be connected with some type of fitting. For the most part, these fittings come in three different flavors. The first of these is the KF connector, which is known by a whole host of other names including QF, DN, and NW. KF originally stood for Kleinflansch, German for small flange, but in the English-speaking world it's become synonymous with quick flange. KF is a type of high vacuum quick connect fitting. It works by holding two chamfered flanges against each other with a circular clamp. A metal centering ring keeps the two flanges concentric, while an elastomeric O-ring actually creates the high vacuum seal. 
KF fittings work all the way up to ultra high vacuum, and depending on what the O-rings are made out of, they'll even survive bake-out, but we'll talk more about bake-out in a minute. The second common type of flange is the conflat, or CF. CF flanges come in a huge range of sizes, and have the advantage of being a completely metal-to-metal -metal vacuum seal. CF fittings are bolted together, with an oxygen-free copper gasket in between. Each flange has a knife edge which bites into the copper, creating a vacuum seal that can survive high temperatures and large temperature changes. Finally, there's the ISO large flange standard, which is also known as the LF, MF, or usually just ISO flange. These work on the same principle as the KF flange, but they can be much larger. ISO flanges basically come in two flavors, the ISO K flange, which is connected with clamps, kind of like a KF flange, and the ISO F flange, which is connected with bolts, in the style of the conflat. With the proper single-sided clamps, you can even connect ISO K to ISO F flanges. Outside of these dedicated high vacuum flanges, you may see other fittings used in vacuum systems depending on the application. Sometimes compression fittings are used, especially at the interface between glass and metal components. Sometimes, although rarely, you'll see pipe threads used in vacuum systems, but usually only where they'll be exposed to rough vacuum and not high vacuum. Threaded fittings are difficult to vacuum seal, even to rough vacuum, but they can be sealed with a high quality Teflon tape or with a type of vacuum sealing wax. In general, you should avoid threaded fittings in vacuum systems, not only because they're hard to seal against actual leaks, but because they present the possibility of virtual leaks. A virtual leak is where gas becomes trapped somewhere in the vacuum system, such as between the threads of a threaded fitting, and then slowly diffuses out over the course of days or even weeks. These look like leaks, and they act like leaks, degrading the vacuum in your system. Unfortunately, they can't be found using any of the usual leak detection methods, so they're a real pain to diagnose. But leaks and virtual leaks aren't the only things that you have to worry about in a high vacuum system. Off-gassing and adsorption can both be huge problems. Off-gassing occurs when a material contains volatile compounds or dissolved gases that continuously evolve out into the atmosphere of the vacuum, preventing the system from pumping down. A sneakier problem is the problem of water and gas molecules adsorbed on the surface of otherwise vacuum-safe materials. Water is especially tenacious, and can usually only be driven out by heating the entire system in a process called bake-out. Even a system that's been thoroughly cleaned to remove all other volatile materials will usually contain a fair amount of water that still needs to be baked out. Alright, so now we can talk about my vacuum system, and we'll start by looking at this theoretical vacuum system that contains only the bare minimum needed to pull the vacuum. It looks pretty good. We've got a roughing pump, we've got a high vacuum pump, and we've got our glass envelope, which is our vacuum chamber. In my case, the mechanical roughing pump is a Welch 1402 Duo Seal. I got a really good deal on the Welch. In fact, it wasn't my first choice for a roughing pump. I tried really hard at the beginning of this project to go completely oil-free because I was so paranoid about contamination. So I ended up buying a handful of relatively inexpensive diaphragm pumps and testing their ultimate vacuum to see if they would work in this application. Unfortunately, for the amount of money that I was willing to spend, I wasn't able to find a diaphragm pump that would do the job, and I wasn't even close to being able to afford a scroll pump. In my early system tests, I actually ended up using a cheap HVAC pump from Harbor Freight. In fact, at that point, I was about ready to call it and just use the Harbor Freight pump in the final system. Luckily, this Welch 1402 popped up on eBay for like 300 bucks. Unfortunately, the seller had no way of verifying that it actually reached rough vacuum. All they could do was put their hand on the inlet and turn the pulley, and they told me that it created suction, which was promising but wasn't a guarantee of any kind. They were also able to tell me that the electric motor still ran, which was a good sign. Unfortunately, they weren't able to drain all of the oil out of the pump before shipping it, and they just had no idea how to pack it for shipping. So by the time it made it to my house, FedEx had beat the absolute hell out of it. The thing was just covered in dirty vacuum oil. The original oil mist filter was completely bent up, and worst of all, the cast iron pulley on the pump body itself had been cracked in half. I checked all the usual suspects for a replacement pulley, Ideal Vac, Lesker, etc. 
A brand new replacement pulley for a Welch 1402 Duo Seal costs more than I paid for that pump. Luckily, I found someone on eBay selling a replacement pulley for like 80 bucks, so I contacted the original seller of the pump and asked them if they'd be willing to reimburse me the amount that it would take to replace the pulley. And shockingly, they did. So after cleaning up the Welch, replacing the pulley and the belt, and doing a flush and an oil change, it worked fine. Shout out to my supporters on Patreon, who bought me these two gallons of Duo Seal pump oil, which cost like 80 bucks a piece. My high vacuum pump is a turbo molecular pump, an Edwards EXT 255H. The Edwards turbo is something that I found on eBay for a screaming deal. The guy had decommissioned a handful of working mass spectrometers and pulled all of these turbos off of it, and he was selling them for like, I don't know, less than $500 a piece, and he was willing to throw in the controller for free. I recently went back and checked on the listing because I thought it might be worth it just to buy another one to have as a spare, but since then he's raised the price to like 1400 bucks, which honestly is closer to what they go for, but it's just a bummer for me. Now the main problem with this system, which you may have already noticed, is that we don't actually have any way of measuring the vacuum inside the vacuum chamber. In fact, we don't even know when it's safe to turn on the turbo molecular pump because we don't have any way to read our roughing pressure. And so we're going to need a vacuum gauge. Actually, we're going to need two vacuum gauges. Here I've added a cross fitting to the inlet of the turbo molecular pump, and on one end I've added a Pirani gauge. The Pirani gauge can read pressure from atmospheric down to rough vacuum. On the other side, I've added an ion gauge. The ion gauge can turn on once we've hit rough vacuum, and it'll continue to measure all the way down into high vacuum. Ah, we should talk about vacuum gauges. There are basically three categories of vacuum gauge. First of all, the ion gauges, the cold cathode penning gauge, and the hot cathode Bayard Alpert gauge. These are basically just vacuum tubes. The Bayard Alpert gauge is built almost exactly like a directly heated triode. As their name implies, ion gauges measure vacuum by measuring the ion current. Basically, the greater the density of gaseous molecules, the more are going to get ionized, and the more ions you have, the more will strike the collector, resulting in a current across the tube. Ion gauges only work in medium to high vacuum, so you can't use them to monitor the pressure in your four line, for instance. For that, you'll want something in the second category of gauges, the convection gauges. This includes the thermocouple gauge and the Pirani gauge. Both of these measure vacuum by the convection cooling of a heating element. Basically, as your gas pressure decreases, there are going to be fewer molecules to carry heat away from a hot filament. The thermocouple gauge measures this convection directly using a thermocouple near the filament. Whereas the Pirani gauge does away with the thermocouple by simply including the filament in a Wheatstone bridge. The last type of vacuum gauge is a capacitance manometer. These measure the vacuum mechanically, by observing the deflection of a diaphragm using a variable capacitor. Capacitance manometers operate in a pretty wide range, all the way from atmosphere down to fine vacuum. And because they measure the vacuum mechanically, they're not calibrated to a specific process gas. Thermocouple gauges will read a different pressure of nitrogen than they would of neon, for instance. This makes capacitance manometers ideal in vacuum systems that you might have to backfill with a process gas. All of these vacuum gauges require controllers to power them and to turn their outputs into pressure readings. I was lucky enough to find this ion gauge controller from a university surplus. And not only does it control a Bayard Alpert gauge, but it actually reads two Pirani gauges for process control. When I received this unit, it was set up to run at 240 volts but luckily there was a wiring diagram on the inside of the case that showed how to configure the jumper wires for 115 volt operation. Okay, so now we can create a vacuum and we can measure a vacuum, but what happens if I find a leak and I need to take the tube off the system to fix it? Remember, we can't expose the running turbo pump or the hot ion gauge to atmospheric pressure. Well, what we could do is turn off the ion gauge, then turn off the turbo pump, let the turbo pump spin all the way down, and then turn off our roughing pump and remove the tube from the top of the system. But it would be a lot easier if we just had a valve that we could shut off, to separate the tube from the rest of the vacuum system. This does improve the situation, but actually not by a whole lot. Because once we close this valve and remove the tube, if we put the tube back on, 
The tube is now back at ambient pressure, and when we open this valve again, we'll be exposing both the ion gauge and the turbo pump to the atmosphere inside of the tube. To avoid that, we actually need to rough down this volume before we can expose it to the rest of the vacuum system. Let's try this. Now we have a T connector here. This T connector leads to another valve, which leads back to the four line. Now we can shut this valve, separating the rest of the vacuum system from our tube. Pull the tube off, put it back on, and then open this valve, rough the tube down, close it again, and then expose the rest of our vacuum system. But actually, this doesn't quite get the job done either, because even with this valve here, when we open this valve, we'll still be exposing the turbo and the ion gauge to the atmosphere inside this volume through the four line. So in addition to these two valves, we need a valve on the outlet of the turbo pump. Now we have enough valves to completely isolate the turbo pump and the vacuum gauges from the rest of the system, but this presents a new problem. When we go to rough down this volume, we don't actually know when we've hit roughing pressure. These two valves have isolated our vacuum gauges from this volume up here, so we actually need another rough vacuum gauge at the top of the system. Now this is looking pretty pro, and you could probably stop here if you had an oil-free roughing pump. Unfortunately, we don't. We have an oil-sealed pump, and if we're not careful, the pump oil from inside our roughing pump is going to find its way into the rest of the system. When we shut down the system by closing all of our valves and letting the turbo spin down, there's still going to be a vacuum in the four line. When the roughing pump stops running to maintain that vacuum, atmosphere can push in through the outlet of the roughing pump and force oil into the four line. To avoid this, we need to add another valve that vents the four line to atmosphere once the system is shut down. Speaking of venting to atmosphere, the whole time that this pump is running, it's going to be pushing oil vapor into the surrounding area. Unless we want to slowly cover all of our equipment in a thin film of vacuum oil, we should put some sort of vapor trap here. Luckily, they make a device specifically for this purpose, called an oil mist eliminator. So we'll add our oil mist eliminator here, and we'll add our four-line vent here. Now this is basically a complete system, at least the vacuum portion of the system. When it comes to high vacuum fittings, you could definitely go to the usual suspects. Kurt J. Lesker, Ideal Vacuum, Dunaway Stockroom, all sell all sorts of vacuum fittings, but they're gonna cost you a pretty penny. So where do I buy all of my vacuum fittings? I'll give you three guesses. eBay is a perfectly reasonable place to buy vacuum fittings, and not even just used ones. I've bought used vacuum equipment, but it always creeps me out a little bit. You never know what kind of contamination you might be dealing with, especially if it was used in the semiconductor industry or in a chem lab. But there are sellers on eBay who are selling brand new vacuum parts. You won't be surprised to learn that the China-based suppliers have the best pricing. And despite having sketchy names like New Day Start or Lab Outlet Deals 365 or Pandarus 988, all of the equipment I've gotten from them has been perfectly cromulent. Of course, if you get something that doesn't work, there's almost no chance you're going to be able to return it. And if you're based in the US, it's going to take a while for these things to ship, usually a couple weeks. If you're looking for cheap suppliers with US stock, there are a couple of them on eBay. Lost Coast Science, aka Loco Science, has been a great place to buy vacuum fittings, and they have stock at a warehouse in the Pacific Northwest, so there's no huge wait times for shipping. And depending on what you're looking for, I believe the seller Brownie in Motion Tech also has some US stock in LA, at least in my experience. If they are drop shipping, they're at least doing it pretty fast. All of these valves are pneumatically actuated. You can get valves that have little knobs on them that you can turn manually, as well as directly controlled solenoid valves but I'm hoping to create a controller that will manage the state of all of these valves to keep me from doing something stupid and venting the turbo to atmosphere. And the cheapest valves that aren't manually actuated are pneumatically actuated. That means I'm gonna need some solenoid valves and a manifold as well as an air compressor to provide pressure for the pneumatic subsystem. There, that's starting to look pretty good, but as long as we're drawing the pneumatic subsystem, let's draw the electrical as well. Here you can see that our air compressor is going to mains, as well as the controller for our turbo, and of course our mechanical roughing pump. But this isn't all of the electrical. Remember, we have vacuum gauges to consider. 
and the vacuum gauges are going to have their own controller which needs to go to mains as well. In addition to the vacuum gauge controller, I've also drawn the pneumatic system controller, even though I'm not exactly sure what this is going to be yet. But I have a feeling it's basically going to be an Arduino with some MOSFETs. And there you have it, the complete system. Looks pretty good to me. So that brings us up to the current state of the vacuum system. I have everything I need, I just need to mount it in a workbench. My current plan is to mount everything inside of this sturdy steel frame that I salvaged from an old labeled surface analysis system that I bought at the local university surplus auction. By putting a tabletop on this frame, I can hide all of the vacuum equipment underneath so it doesn't get damaged, while leaving the compression port sticking out the top for easy access. I could even build a small oven on top of the compression fitting to bake out tubes during pump down, and that oven could double as an annealing oven. But all of that is work that still needs to be done. Thank you everybody for watching this video. I am so sorry it took so long to get out. Uh, there was just, as always, way more material to cover than I realized. Also, I've been traveling for work, so a lot of this video got edited in my hotel room in Colorado, but still didn't get posted until I got here back at home. Hopefully it won't be quite so long before the next update. Speaking of which, I've submitted a talk to Hackaday Super Conference all about vacuum tube stuff, and I just got word that that talk has been accepted. And so if you're going to be at Hackaday Super Conference in Pasadena in November, try to find me and we'll nerd out about vacuum stuff. And for those of you who can't make it, as soon as the recording of my presentation is live on the Hackaday YouTube channel, I will add it to a playlist on this channel so you can check it out. In the meantime, I've basically dropped a bunch of other projects to try to sprint towards having some sort of glass vacuum thing to show off at Supercon. Thank you, of course, to all of my patrons. You all make this possible and you take some of the financial sting out of all of this tinkering. If you're not a patron, you can go to patreon.com slash integrated therm and support the channel for just a few bucks a month. My high roller triode level patrons have their names at the end of every video like you're seeing now, but every little bit helps. The Patreon is also a great place to get updates between videos, as well as give me feedback about the videos or about the vacuum tubes or whatever it is you want to chat about. All right, I'm finally going to wrap this video up and I will see you all next time.